start. Thanks again for that uh, introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I think Mike and I really appreciate uh, this invitation and also, of course, thanks to our audience for coming along today. Um, so Mike and I are going to do a little bit of a double act, looking at really the changing role of natural science collections, why they're so critical to addressing some of our big science and societal challenges. And our talk is going to be quite a mixture of issues covering collections, infrastructure, digitization, uh, big data, and also looking quite a bit about the impact of that data and, and how that's having um, and, uh, addressing some of these big challenges. We'll be looking at this partly from an institutional perspective, but also in the, uh, in the context of these various national and international programs that we're both involved in. So with that, let's make a start. So I think natural science collections are probably most famous for some of their iconic specimens, things like Darwin's finches, leading to the theory of evolution, uh, the, this iguanodon hoop tooth here, uh, central to uh, Richard Owen's understanding of uh, dinosaurs, uh, uh, otherwise things like this, this, dinosaur, this um, uh, skull, Neanderthal skull looking at human evolution. But in a way, that sort of gives a false impression of those collections, and in particular, the sheer size and scale of those collections. So Natural History Museum London, for example, has something in the region of 76 million specimens, just a fraction of those are on display, maybe 30,000. We're typically adding to that collection, and of course that's a really variable number of what we add, but in any one year, we might add between 30 and maybe 150,000 specimens. Um, we have something in the region of uh, 8,000 scientific visitors, at least in a non-COVID year. Um, and um, we're up to now something in the region of 5 million public visitors, uh, a really extraordinary number. Uh, we'll typically loan out vast numbers of specimens annually, maybe up to 70,000 annually. And we have a science staff of around 300 and a really substantial PhD presence as well. So um, up to about 100, 100 and sometimes even 150 PhD students. And increasingly that volume of collections is becoming really important to answer some of the big science and societal challenges about issues that certainly we care a great deal about. Issues like food security, healthcare, biodiversity, um, uh, conservation, climate change, etc. Uh, and we all know, I think with, I'm preaching to the converted, that these are very much central to our sustainability. Um, NHM London also recently declared a planetary emergency um, as part of our strategy. And a lot of our work now is repositioned around basically trying to address that planetary emergency and providing a lot of the evidence that feeds into a lot of national policy commitments and there's a raft of those policy commitments here where there's a direct line between the data that's associated with collections and then through science um, feeding that data into various policy commitments and of course there's a lot of societal recognition about the role of natural history and natural science collections too um, I picked this example I could have picked many just recently, um, uh, a new GCSE on natural history was announced, trying to embed that into the, uh, uh, the curriculum. So this talk between Mike and I is gonna cover a little bit about um, our origins, how we started to make that transition to digital. We're gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about the impact then of those digital collections, how we're scaling up, how we're doing things nationally, and also what's going on on the international stage and how we fit into that. So with that, we're gonna start with Mike and um, he's gonna talk a little bit about the BGS origins. So from the origin of the survey in 1835, uh, we've made our collections available to the public for study and for education. And the Museum of Practical Geology that ran through from German Street to Piccadilly was opened by Prince Albert in 1851. It was a highly specimen rich display. All the crown jewels were there. Anybody could walk around as indeed Darwin and Lyle did on uh, one of the balconies while they were discussing matters in London. Uh, we even published next uh, instructional catalogues and you can download this from Google Books, next. But 
After moves to South Kensington in 1935 and then to Keyworth in Nottingham, far fewer specimens were on display. Indeed, in Keyworth, uh, virtually everything was in store. And when the collections were moved, the scientific community uh, actually expressed concern because it had been convenient in the past to visit the Natural History Museum, study material, and then pop next door to the Geological Museum. Next. So um, clearly the internet was a good means to address this concern. And when I arrived at BGS in 2000, it's been one of my drivers to make the collections more accessible. Unfortunately, the BGS strategy in 2000, the new strategy at that point, actually included the introduction of online collections databases within five years. And we started this with an online GIS with borehole information that was launched in November 2000. Next. Next. So we followed over the next five years with online databases uh, for mineralogy and petrology. Next. Paleontology. Next. And borehole and related materials. Next. And this meant in terms of specimens that were visible to the public, in other words, specimens that you didn't need to make an appointment to go and see. So I'm including not only the material that was on display and material that was loaned to the public. So back in 1900, we were talking about something like 60,000 specimens on display or visible by the public without appointment. Um, and then with the move to Keyworth, uh, this was very drastically reduced. But as soon as we went online, next, uh, you can see, note the difference in scales, that we had uh, by 2020, we had over a million specimens available in databases. And as we'll talk later, uh, a significant proportion of these were present as detailed images and even downloadable 3D models. Next. So BGS, I think, was a little bit of ahead of the curve of Natural History Museum in terms of their kind of digital thinking. Um, and when I arrived at the museum, Natural History Museum in 2006, it was, um, I started to sort of look at what was going on digitally. And this little back of the envelope calculation here, which I did in 2008, um, don't worry too much about the numbers, but the headline from this is that there were lots of little digitization projects going along. But if you started to add up and try to work out how long it would take to digitize the collection from those little projects, it was going to be about 900 years to get the data and a further 500 years to take the pictures. Um, so clearly we were, we were not progressing at a particularly fast rate uh, at, at that time. But fortunately, I think some really big transformative technologies were coming along digital, of course, being one of them, the others critical to this being the genomic revolution and also citizen science. And um, eventually we got ourselves sufficiently organized to start from internal funding, um, a, a really uh, a much more comprehensive program of digitization. We have this sort of Google-esque mission to collate, organize and make available uh, one of the most, world's most important natural history collections. And at the time we set the sort of ambition to digitize about 20 million specimens. And we had this really quite transformative program and many of th this, this sort of high level plan, much of this actually bore fruit and really holds true today. It's kind of rare that that exists in um, big organizational settings, but we looked at all the various areas that we felt we needed to transform to really get us fit for digital, which of course is far more than just the act of digitization. It's about transforming our policies, our infrastructure, our people. Uh, and so we put in place this kind of high level plan and really to kind of get things going, started with some pilot digitization projects. And there, is, there are, uh, were a number of these, and I'll just dip into a few um, actually, but maybe first just mention what kind of data it is that we're trying to unlock from those specimens. So each of those specimens, often we would have a species level list of what was in the collection, but we wouldn't have a specimen level list. And once you start to look at the individual specimens, you can unlock a world of different data. Molecular data, although obviously that requires um, uh, certain technologies, chemical data, morphological data, geospatial information, 
taxonomic, ecological information, it's all locked either in the specimen or in the series of labels that are associated with it. And I think it's also worth referencing, what do we mean by digitization? Because of course, it's almost how long is a piece of string that can mean many different things for different communities. We now are in the position where we actually have a standard so that we can start to compare what we're doing in the context of digitization with others. So we have this concept of the minimum information for a digital specimen and these different levels of digitization with what we call MIDS2 being kind of research ready. So typically that would contain the minimum level of information that a lot of our researchers are wanting to do uh, using those specimens. So we started with these pilot projects and we chose a few taxa which we thought were going to potentially be quite impactful. One of those was um, uh, the UK butterfly and moths collection, really quite an enormous collection. There's a very long history of collecting butterflies and moths in this country. A particular focus on the butterflies to begin with, the moths are a bit harder because there's a lot more species of them. And we really started to refine our digitization processes to um, uh, uh, speed up that digitization. And we were able to get through about 800,000 specimens um, in uh, about three years and bring the cost down to essentially about a pound a specimen. And almost whichever way you cut it now, that figure of a pound, a dollar, a euro, often uh, with our international peers, Although the average, the, although the, there's considerable variance in cost of digitization between different specimens, the average often ends up equating to about a pound, a dollar, a euro, etc. Um, another group that we looked at are, are, as our slide collection. This in particular is our parasitic louse um, slide collection. We have about 1.2 million slides. Um, and again, a lot of the advantage of working with microscope slides is that they're very regular. So um, they're quite standardized and it's easier to um, go about extracting information um, from those. And in some cases, we were able to digitize as many as sort of seven, 800 uh, specimens a day by one person and extract that information. Often we're a lot less interested in the images than the uh, data that's on the specimen. And I think that's an important point to mention um, images are very important, particularly for certain, kind of, for certain kinds of specimens. And of course, they uncap all sorts of interesting opportunities about what you can do with that digital object. But a, a lot of it is the data associated with the specimen. At that time also, we had no real mechanism of getting our data out there and making it available. And so simultaneously, we built um, uh, the Natural History Museum data portal, um, which is essentially our platform where people can access, browse, download, cite um, uh, the collection. And I could probably speak for another whole talk about the data portal, but I, I, I won't. Um, I'm only going to talk really a little bit more about um, uh, the, the tracking and um, data citation a little bit on that. But it's worth noting that that was a huge undertaking to kind of get that, um, uh, get that up and uh, in operation. So a huge amount of what we do now is really about um, uh, understanding the impact of that collection, those digital collections, and demonstrating that impact. And in this next section, I want to talk a little bit about how, um, how we do that. So um, perhaps fairly commonly, ubiquitously now, people are using dashboards for everything. We built a very early dashboard um, tracking use of our digital collections, and because Every data set has a DOI, every specimen record has a permanent URL, every version is, um, uh, has a permanent URL as well. We can provide really granular data about how our collections are being used. And this dashboard here, I just pull out some key facts. So since 2015, when that um, uh, data portal was launched, we've had 31 billion records flow out of that portal in nearly 500,000 data sets. And they have been cited in uh, 1,744 publications. At least that was on Monday. I looked this morning and that figure is up by nine. So in the space of just the last five days, there are nine new papers that are using our collections. 
So really um, amazing levels of use uh, for that. And we try and track in quite a a level, high level of detail, the kinds of users essentially. So um, this is our uh, interface for doing that. And on the left hand side, you can see that list of topics. So we've got things like climate change, conservation, ecology, human health, um, uh, taxonomy, obviously, agriculture. And those numbers correspond to the number of publications that are linked um, through to those topics. Uh, we can also see things like um, uh, the, the uh, major publishers. So who from what country is using our data? And typically UK users, so UK researchers are number two in that list at any one time. US researchers are normally at the top. Uh, and then as you can imagine, there's a, a long tail. We can do things like understand, at least for those non-global studies, what countries people are publishing about. Um, Brazil, perhaps not surprisingly, is um, uh, top of the list. And then in this dashboard, each of this kind of this long list, each of those are kind of publications um, that are using our data. So this is just one that was published um, just a week or so ago climate warming changes, synchrony of plants and pollinators. And we can track there the DOIs that they're citing. And we can also see very specifically what specimens they're using from our digitized collections. Um, and of course, most of these studies are not just using one institution's collections. They're using a real mix of uh, data from a variety of institutions where we can see what NHM London specimens are being cited um, as part of that. So in this case, about 10,000 specimens. Um, so really quite amazing granular data on how those collections are being used. And I thought it'd be useful just to kind of showcase a few examples of this um, uh, from a range of different areas. Um, and Mike and I are just going to sort of dip in and talk a little bit about some of those examples. Um, I just did a quick snapshot of news um, associated with digitized natural history collections just when I put these slides together on Monday. Um, there are some examples of um, things like our horseshoe bats being digitized in relation to the COVID pandemic. Lots of new species are discovered in collections. There's typically about 20, 25,000 new species described every year. About half of that number are not found from field research, they're found in the back of museum drawers. And digitizing those collections, of course, sheds light on those specimens. So there's stuff here on 3D reconstruction of Darwin specimens, um, some uh, publications on, um, uh, a publication on avian color gradients um, using NHM London collections, stuff on wheat uh, domestication and genotyping. And a lot of work goes into um, uh, red list indexing as well. So these are conservation threat assessments that are done off the back of um, natural science collections, usually trying to determine the maximum area of extent of a species and the impact of usually climate uh, would have on, on that species. Um, just a few more examples, sort of a bit more in depth on that. So probably one of the biggest users of natural science collections are those interested in using those collections data for historical baselines. Um, uh, and you can see kind of biotic responses, particularly to climate change, when you have a long series of specimens that have been collected. And our butterfly collections actually have been really well used in this regard. So you can see things like changes in geographic range, changes in phenology, so maybe early flowering times, um, uh, earlier insect emergence, changes in body size as well. And the butterfly collections have been used extensively actually on this. Um, a really nice paper um, relatively recently, um, Steve Brooks from NHM London, Philip Benberg from Southampton, they've been looking at the uh, uh, impact of climate on those butterfly collections. And uh, they've actually essentially mapped Met Office data to, uh, on climate to our historical collections of, uh, of from, um, in this case, just a few species. And they can see things like the bigger body size, the earlier emergence of the pupa, 
the changes in the geographic range. They started doing this with just a handful of species. It's very labor intensive to sort of generate those measurements, but now they've accelerated that through computer vision pipelines. So this is um, some software that they've built, Mothra, which looks at our images and basically generates and automatically extracts a lot of the measurements that they need. And so moving from essentially two, actually it's three species in that first paper, they've now managed to process about half of our species. And again, detect those changes in body size um, uh, uh, and um, uh, look at emergent states by mapping environmental data and linking that to um, our collections data. Um, and that's quite typical, I think, of actually quite a lot of the way that um, collections um, are, are being used at the moment. Because we have that intensity of sampling, um, often for many hundreds of years, often the only source of evidence about where a species was, um, if you go beyond something like 1975, when a lot of the uh, efforts to uh, re recording efforts sort of really systematically kicked in in the UK, the only source of that evidence is really through collections, and that's why they're so critical. This is another nice example. Actually, this one kind of combined um, digitization with citizen science. This is Gavin Thomas's team. He was looking at our bird collections, and um, in this case, they were digitizing our birds, and in particular, bird beaks, and looking for changes in the um, morphology of those bird, bird beaks. Um, the citizen science element of this was the public were asked to put particular landmarks on those bird beaks because it's quite hard to automate that. Um, and then there was this giant meta-analysis uh, of all those, um, uh, of all that data, essentially mapping that to the phylogeny of birds and looking at um, uh, patterns and bursts of beak evolution across those birds. It's a really nice um, study and attracted quite a lot of press attention. Um, this is even more recent, another bird study. Um, this is a most amazing data set of bird traits. So this is Joe Tobias at Imperial College. He and his army of students um, were visiting various museums. Natural History Museum London constituted probably about 50% of the specimens that they examined. And they were extracting uh, various kind of traits of birds um, this covers almost every single bird species, bar about 350 bird species. So an enormous amount of work went into the compilation of that data set. And anyone interested now in looking at um, the ecological patterns of variation across birds, certainly using those traits, that's an amazing resource that has just been published, actually. Um, really exciting. And then over to Mike. Okay, well, in 2009, BGS operated three core stores, and the decision was taken to move uh, the contents of two of those down into um, a centre of excellence, effectively, at our Keyworth core store. And that meant we were going to have to move about 175,000 boxes of core from Gilmerton up in Edinburgh, where we held the UK Continental Shelf Hydrocarbon Reference Archive. And I realized as we were going to have to open every box to add additional packaging before we moved it, it would be um, a waste of time not to take photographs at the same time. So we did that. We built a special setup. And next, it enabled us to take some really high quality, high resolution core images. And in fact, on the, the, the full resolution, I can see more detail on the images than I can do on the core without using a microscope or magnifying glass. And these images we know are used by all the operators in the UK continental shelf. They're well used by academics and they've also been used by a number of AI projects, including one at the Colorado School of Mines that's uh, written code to extract the actual core pieces and manipulate them. And uh, at BGS, we've been doing uh, code to quantify the quality, the number of breaks and that in the core. We also know it improves efficiency in the core store because visitors can look at the images of the core before they uh, come on site and they only need to ask for those uh, bits of core that they actually need to address the problems. 
next. So we did the uh, photography with uh, a um, effectively a production line and the boxes came down from storage, were opened and put in a jig. The barcode was read and that displayed all the information from the database. Um, it then went underneath the, um, in this case, it was a phase one camera, quite an expensive high resolution camera. The image was taken, checked, everything was controlled with barcodes. So if the image was fine, uh, the photographer scanned a, an accept barcode. If it needed retaking, he would scan a retake barcode. And then the um, material went down the conveyor and extra packaging was added before it was placed on pallets ready to transport down to Keyworth. So this was a very successful exercise that by using this approach, um, we were able to do it in just over a year and a half, whereas some of industry thought it would take us 10 years to photograph the entire collection. Next, please. Another um, imaging project we've done has been with our thin sections. As Finn said, slides are ideal uh, because they are fairly uniform. And we now have 160,000 petrological thin sections, all digitized and online. And each one of those is um, present both as a plain polars and a cross polars image. So it's actually twice that number. And you can spot them on our GIS. Every one of the little black triangles represents uh, a specimen with a scanned image. And we know this has been well used by academics. Next, please. Next. And it raises the point that when we take the photographs, we don't do the ultimate highest resolution possible, and we don't use a system that can rotate it to uh, capture the slide in all the different orientations under the cross polars. We look on this as essentially a discovery tool so that academics, commercial companies can decide whether they need to visit or borrow the slide for more research. But we do know that actually for many purposes, these images have been perfectly adequate. Next. And actually we've used a fairly simple setup to do it. And I should say a volunteer or volunteers at Edinburgh and Keyworth have done most of the work. Thanks, next. Okay, um, and a new project, um, we realized that a lot of tight fossils were first described in the middle of the 19th century, might be a cryptic comment in the collections of the Reverend Green and in many cases, the, the present whereabouts of some of the types was unknown. So it seemed to me an important project to seek these out, to re-photograph them. And we got, we got funding from GISC to not only re-photograph, but also to laser scan a couple of thousand of the um, most suitable fossils. So next, please. So as well as doing straight photography, high resolution photography, we also did stereo pairs using a simple uh, seesaw mechanism. Next. And given that this was uh, over 10 years ago, we were using what's now a fairly primitive um, laser 3D scanner. But the results were excellent and they're all available online and downloadable from our database. Next, please. So this is the GB3D website. Um, you can search um, for um, taxonomy, fossil type, institution, and so forth. Next, please. Um, and then you can view uh, the specimens. As I said, high resolution images. We serve them as in JP2 format to maximize the uh, resolution and to minimize the uh, download speed. Next. So you can actually uh, see, um, as you zoom in, very, very high resolution. Next, please. So in total, um, we digitized 17,500 types um, and 2,000 3D digital models. Now, what was innovative about this is that uh, we got funding from GIS, but we worked with a number of partner hubs 
including the National Museum of Wales, Cardiff, the Cedric Museum, Cambridge, and the University Museum of Natural History in Oxford. And through the Geological Curators Group, we worked with a number of regional and university museums. So we had a system of effectively hubs, and you could call it nodes. So in some ways, this could form a pilot project for some of the work that may now take place um, that Vince is going to talk about next in DISCO. So um, uh, that's a nice segue into kind of how we at NHM London started to sort of scale up our thinking around digitization. Um, and we really needed to kind of uh, have a much more organized program. Um, uh, organization is really key to really de developing kind of high throughput programs that are generating large amounts of data. So we structured our work into a set of what we would call core test program and delivery activities. Delivery being um, uh, those projects that are currently uh, running and delivering at kind of high throughput. Test is really about developing and innovating the various workflows that we needed to develop to support certain kinds of digitization. So we literally have specimens that range from uh, maybe a tiny parasitoid calcid wasp, perhaps smaller than a full stop uh, on a page, through to maybe a dinosaur femur, certainly larger than the room that I'm in um, presently. And we've got to develop workflows that cater for really that wide range of uh, different types of specimens. We also needed to transform the people that we had. Um, digitization is very much a team sport. It requires a real range of people and it's quite labor intensive. So technology can certainly help us and we'll see in a little bit how technology is helping us to speed things up. But it's, there's a lot of people there's a, sorry, a lot of specimens, there's a lot of manual handling. Um, robotics can only get us so far, uh, and realistically at the moment it's far cheaper still to um, uh, have a, a standing digitization team. And in NHM London, we had to build up that team. So as I mentioned, we started to work on these different digitization workflows um, uh, of various different kinds to support the, the diverse kinds of objects that we had within the collection. Some types of specimens lend themselves very much to I guess what I would call almost industrial scale digitization a little bit like the kind that Mike was talking about where you almost have a conveyor bay belt style production and probably the kinds of specimens that most lend themselves to this are herbarium sheets so this is the way that most botanical material is preserved it's typically preserved on a sheet flat squished down essentially piece of plant there's a nice, usually nice big label uh, with lots of fairly structured metadata uh, and they're relatively easy to barcode. And they certainly lend themselves to this sort of style of conveyor belt um, uh, digitization. And in a few cases, particularly in partnership with Q, uh, Royal Botanic Gardens Q, we've, we've, we've done some projects of that ilk um, to uh, speed up the digitization of our botanical material. Um, we have to do quite a lot of innovation because of the very weird nature of our collections. And as you can see, in the early days in particular, we used quite a lot of Lego um, to help us do that innovation. And I had to um, do some rather strange sort of justifications of why we're buying large boxes of Lego. Um, but they're a great, it's a great way of very cheaply um, uh, innovating and creating tools to kind of that we can then build in our workshop to actually kind of scale up uh, and if you like um, build a bit more resilience into our digitization processes. Um, in the early days of our program there was quite a lot of emphasis on drawers so many natural science collections are basically preserved usually in little unit trays little cardboard trays and then they're held in drawers um, and of course, our inset collections are really um, significant in that respect. We've got maybe a, um, we have about 30 million insects, um, but only in 150,000 drawers. Um, the challenge with the drawers is that what you really want to get to is the label data associated with those specimens. And um, many of our processes don't really uh, can't, uh, struggle to get to that label information. So uh, uh, the only way of dealing with that is either to unskewer all of those labels that are associated with the specimens and lay them out, 
Um, or what we've actually done now is built a multi-camera setup and something we call ALICE, which stands for Angled Label Image Capture Equipment. And what that does is uses a combination of computer vision um, and machine learning to take one single snapshot of that picture of that specimen from multiple angles. And then we use software to segment out the different regions of the label and stitch that together into one human readable image, which we can then transcribe. Um, a bit like Mike said, barcodes are absolutely central to our process. And we've gone to the point of encoding a lot of the metadata on specimens into barcodes so that as you take the image, you then instantly, in effect, transcribe that, uh, key, those key bits of information to populate our databases. And in terms of digitization rates, um, we can, in some workflows, I think the most we've ever done is something in the region of about 1,600 specimens a day. That's for one person. But uh, there's enormous variance in that. Different workflows um, lend themselves to different processes. And then you can see the average for most of those workflows is much lower. It's probably more in the region of two to 400 specimens a day. Um, uh, we're also kind of always comparing ourselves to others. Other institutions are involved in this process to see whether we're more efficient or not. Um, and in short, a lot of the NHM processes are pretty efficient. And now what we're really trying to do is focus on building up the national program of digitization. So within the UK, it's estimated that there's something like 100 and maybe 150 million in total from the surveys that we've conducted, um, uh, partly through AHRC funding, we've now been able to track down, if you like, about 137 million specimens. And we know those are present in um, uh, uh, 84 institutions across the UK. And there's this um, uh, beautiful dashboard, if you follow that link, bit.ly slash disco UK, where uh, you can see um, some of the detail about what's in those collections um, and uh, uh, really get kind of a, a, a much stronger sense of the, the, the content of them. Um, uh, and there's a bit more data uh, uh, there about what's in those collections. Very few of them have digitized records in any form and a very small margin proportion of those are what we would call research ready data. So there's a huge amount of work to support those institutions in terms of getting that those collections digitized and research ready. And a lot of the issues there relate to basically funding, staff. Um, many of these are mixed collections, so they don't just have natural science collections. And sometimes getting prioritizing those natural science collections is quite hard within those institutions which have very diverse collections. We're working on a national digitization plan. And in fact, we've just uh, about to publish the blueprint for that, which is a 28 page document, um, a sort of snazzy brochure, if you like, really outlining how we want to um, approach that from a national perspective. We've also generated a lot of training resources and looking at the economic case for digitization too. Um, and NHM London just recently has published uh, a report which essentially says that if we were to digitize just the NHM London collection alone, we'd unlock something in the region of 2.2 to 4 billion in benefits to the economy over the next 25 years. Um, and the DOI for that uh, report is available um, there. But there's all sorts of sectors of the economy where the digitized collections are really important. We're doing similar things internationally as well. So we lead an initiative called the One World Collection where we're serving the top, nearly the top 100, it's the top 72 institutions worldwide. We can track down about 1.1 billion specimens across those institutions. And we're also looking at things like the, um, the, uh, the skills, uh, the taxonomic skills within those institutions as part of that survey. There's no real kind of global shortcut to funding. If you look at our peers, most of the money has come internationally from governments. Um, and this is a quick snapshot, a very dirty snapshot and a very incomplete snapshot of other countries that are funding their digitization programs. Uh, a lot of the work in the UK has come under the auspices of something called DISCO, the Distributed System of Scientific Collections, which is really trying to integrate 
UK natural science, uh, uh, European natural science collections and create a common digital gateway to those collections. And right now we're very much focused on um, uh, building that digital gateway, that data uh, portal for UK collections, getting a bit more of a sense of how to support the diverse nature of UK institutions in terms of their digitization capabilities. Uh, and then also, of course, building the funding case um, for supporting that. And I think at one minute over, I will stop there um, and hand back to Adrian. Um, thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Vince and Mike. Uh, fascinating, fascinating talk. And um, the scale of all of this is just mind blowing, really, isn't it? It's a huge challenge, but it's uh, really interesting stuff. Um, we we have a few questions from the uh, from the Q and A. If, if so, I'll put some of those to you, if I may. Um, and and starting with um, a couple of questions about digitization rates. Um, so. Um, one is, is just asking to, to what extent are new collections that are being collected now, are they, are they digitized as a matter of course? Um, and then a related question, so how is the rate of digitization changing over time uh, now? Um, and a, a suggestion that it, if, if that's increasing exponentially and also the, the sort of digital profile of a, a specimen or a collection is also exponentially growing, what does that mean in terms of sort of storage requirements for all of this information? Great questions. Um, maybe if I answer the new question first, um, are new collections being digitized? So um, yes, for some. Uh, uh, so the uh, we run pilots across uh, Natural History Museum um, with certain departments, particularly insects, actually, which have kind of really embraced uh, this and really kind of feel the, the, the seeing kind of the value. So new entomological collections are being digitized. Um, but that's not universally true across all collection types. And in part that is because um, we don't have workflows still for certain kind of very complex collections. So a lot of the material in spirit, for example, so that's preserved usually in a mixture of ethanol and actually much more rarely now formalin. And a lot of that wet material is not digitized um, uh, as it comes in. It's just too hard at the moment to do it. Um, Mike, uh, where does it stand with BGS, the new material? Well, um, in terms of the, the main existing projects I've talked about, yes, any new um, UK continental shell hydrocarbon core is automatically uh, photographed and imaged and put up. Um, likewise, type fossils and thin sections. But I have to say, our resources for digitizing are very, very limited. And uh, though I didn't stress it, um, all the three main projects we've done have been financed uh, through other sources and not through uh, normal BGS um, income. So we had uh, just funded on the GB3D. The uh, core was initially at least photographed through, in actual fact, the whole project was financed through the sale of the core store in Edinburgh. And um, as I said, the uh, thin sections have all been done by volunteers. So the, yes, it's true that core budget is used to photograph the new hydrocarbon cores, but we are very, very tight. So the answer is uh, we are doing relatively little, but those projects that are ongoing, we are keeping them up to date. Yeah, we've certainly, I mean, certainly that funding issue is kind of critical to us. And the only way that NHM London has been able to do it in the absence of any national funding program is really by scraping core funding and actually making it an institutional priority. And I've had to, over many years, really kind of hammer that message around how and why this is so important to our future mission. And actually the way that we looked at this is almost the counterfactual. So sort of the way that I've often made the argument was what would happen if we did not digitize our collections and actually the kind of the uh, the fear about our collections becoming less and less relevant is partly what's driven that case but the truth is it requires big money very big money you know in the region of probably 150 million to do a national digitization program and all other countries have only done it through national funding. I think the other question was about rates, Adrian. Um, um, wasn't it? Yeah, and, and what I guess what increases in digitization rates and increases in information requirements, what, what does that mean in terms of sort of the overall data 
volume. Yeah, so the information uh, the information requirements one, at least for us, um, I wouldn't say it's a red herring, but it's much less of an issue than you might think. So certain kinds of digitization certainly generate vast amounts of data. But typically we are, um, you know, the, the, the kinds of data that we're liberating outside of the images, um, uh, which are, you know, not ridiculously large. I mean, a, a high resolution image of a herbarium sheet, for example, might be 500 megabytes. A CT scan uh, would be, you know, upwards of 40 gig, but then you are, we're not doing that routinely. That is not a kind of a part of our standard processes. So the, the, some of the storage requirements are actually relatively low and often we get a lot of questions about them, but I always feel they're a bit of a red herring. It's not the bigger challenge. The bigger challenge is basically turning the handle, so to speak, to speed up the rates. Um, I think rates for certain kinds of collections are plateauing a little bit. Um, so our insect digitization rate has been massively sped up by um, the adoption of that Alice system the, uh, with using the angled label, uh, angled cameras. Um, but there are lots of exceptions where that just doesn't work. Um, you know, I have, I have seen specimens with 16 labels all skewered on a pin. They're too close to make that system work or where the labels are folded. And of course, then again, you can't get access to the data. So there's enormous um, uh, uh, variance. Um, the real issue for us is probably the other workflows. So trying to develop workflows for things like those wet collections. A lot of the paleontological material is really fragile. You can't apply some of the high throughput processes that we would like to it. Uh, the micro paleo material, which will be in, in a you'll have kind of jaw bones the size of not quite a full stop but at really tiny um, and, and, and those we just haven't worked on yet so there's an element of just sort of biting off what we can um, and then getting at the most the fastest rate possible out of that and some of that's been I mean artificial intelligence and machine learning are really helping in some areas of that and we've got relationships with Turing and um, Google and a few others in terms of helping us with um, it, dealing with that. Great. Um, a, a couple of questions about methods, if I may. Um, so I think uh, a couple for, for Mike, actually. One, one was around what GIS technology BGS use for their their work um, to with GIS and, and profiles, um, and the, the second one is around the the volunteers that were referred to. So, who, how are how are these non professionals identified and harnessed, and sort of who are they? Are they hobbyists, retirees? What, where do the volunteers come from? Um, and so, that, I guess those are for Mike, and then and then one for you, Vince, is is around the um, the scanning activities for species. So we heard a bit about the the three D scanning for fossils but it, it, do you do 3d scanning for for species um so i don't know if mike wants to to comment on the the gis technology and the volunteers first right on the gis i should say that it's not my special subject but we are heavily involved in esri product i have a feeling some of the earlier stuff was based on arcmap but what i would suggest is uh if um somebody wants to put their send me an email um or get an email to me, I can put them in touch with the people best able to advise them. As far as the volunteers, we have a mix. Um, we actually used to, when we were based at the University of Edinburgh, have quite a large number of volunteers, which included students who were looking for work experience and retired staff members and retired other people. Um, and we tend to put them on jobs that are effectively for the public good. So they are um, jobs like this that's opening up the collections for the whole community and on the website. That we feel is, is an appropriate use of volunteers. So it's a full mix, uh, but it's one lady you could see, I think was um, a student was doing it for work experience. Down in Keyworth, some of our volunteers have actually been retired staff members. Great, thanks Mike. Um, and then Vince, the, uh, the question about the scanning activities and whether there are there a 3D scanning of species going so, on? Yeah, so we have um, 
we have a lot of 3D scanning going on in all sorts of guises. And the issue is it's not really high throughput. Um, and, and that's really, and, it, and that is unlocking an enormous potential for certain specimens, but it doesn't scale um, so well. Um, one area that really is being given quite a lot of attention is, um, so generating the 3D models off the back of those CT scans is quite time consuming in, in, in multiple ways. And a lot of that involves the placement of landmarks, homologous landmarks over those um, scan slices, which then form the 3D models. And that's something where we're using artificial intelligence to help um, uh, quite a bit. So um, there's a program, um, Anjali Goswami within the museum is applying AI to try and basically generate 3D models at scale. She does some amazing phenomics work. So looking at um, evolution of the phenome and understanding how, how and why the, the phenome has evolved over time. And she generates thousands of these 3D models. But again, that's very much reliant on an army of students. And um, one thing I should say we're very poor on is making access to those 3D models. So we do, and this is sort of a bit of a, a mission of mine, um, I say a mission of mine at the moment, it's been a mission of mine for a long time, but I will try to crack it, is we have tens of thousands of scans that are not plugged into our data portal at the moment. A tiny number of those make it through to various kind of third party 3D repositories. And um, uh, I'd like to do a much better job essentially building our back end workflows so that a lot more of that 3D data is available. Um, there are pockets of availability um, and um, Phenome 10K, if you Google that, you'll see one of those pockets, for example, but that's really the tip of the iceberg. So the issue is though, it's still scale. It just doesn't scale as well. Yeah, great, excellent. Um, a couple of final questions. One, one is, is, is access to all of the data free or is, is some of it, is there charges for accessing some of it? So in our case, it's all free. Um, uh, we're open by default. We have a series of eight, what we call exception areas where we would hold data back for legitimate reasons. Um, and um, often those are to do with things like there may be sensitive information about a specimen either um, ethically sensitive, culturally sensitive, or in many cases, the you know exposing the geospatial range of a species may endanger that species. And in those cases, we will hold that data back. We do a little bit of scientific embargoing, not a lot, but there is a route um, for requesting an embargo. Um, and you can get a one-year embargo fairly easily and a three-year embargo a bit harder. And if you want to renew that embargo, you've got to have a pretty good case. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, it is, um, uh, for the most part, all free. And I, I don't know, is that the case for BDS, Mike? Yes, in general, um, certainly the stuff that's on the website is all free. Clearly, if somebody needed a more detailed scan or photograph, um, if that was academic, it would almost certainly be free. If it was a commercial company, there could well be a charge. So it's this question of the difference between the sort of discovery resolution and really detailed work that may be required for a specific scientific project. And there may be a charge in doing that. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Um, a, a final question um, is, would, would you consider it worthwhile to digitize data only in the first instance, and then add the images later? So for example, for fossils? So is there any, any sort of mileage in splitting those two things out? Well, I could say that certainly we started off, um, as I tried to explain, with purely metadata, purely the um, digital data, the text from the uh, registers or from the labels with the specimens. And in terms of the fossil material, yes, something like 300, 400,000 specimens are like that. Um, then images followed later and we have far fewer images but I have to say, I do consider the images very important. And I'm well aware that there are some, particularly in um, some of the Baltic countries, there are really well digitized collections photographed. And those photographs have actually been recognized by workers elsewhere in the world and uh, um, actually led to subsequent research and publications. 
So yes, text is important, but images are actually really important too. Yeah, thanks Mike. Okay, um, I'm conscious of time, so I think that we've probably reached the, the end of the session. So um, a great big thank you again to, um, to Vince and Mike for a fascinating talk and for all that useful discussion afterwards. Thank you very much for that.